Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining our presentation today on sidecar architectures and liquid-cooled bus bars. Just to quickly introduce myself, my name is Hal Lockett. I'm a system architect at T Connectivity, and joining me on stage today is Dimitri Shapiro, mechanical engineer at Meta. And while we're the two speaking today, uh, we both represent larger teams, so I very quickly want to acknowledge Roger Lowe, Brian Costello, and Lily Zhang from TE Connectivity, and then John Fernandez from Meta. Uh, just a quick overview of our agenda today. Uh, first, we're going to begin with a little bit of background in industry power trends, along with where we're going with uh, liquid-cooled bus bar design and testing updates, and where we're headed with the next generation of liquid-cooled bus bars. Uh, then we'll share some information on sidecar power rack architectures and horizontal bus bars, and pushing the boundaries for these horizontal bus bars. And then finally, a call to action. Uh, first, a little bit of background on industry power trends. And if we take a step back and really look at a 50,000 foot view of what's going on in industry right now, what we're seeing is chips are consuming more power than ever before, higher TDPs. Combine that with increased density, so a significant increase in how many chips we're putting in a rack, higher power chips. And then when you scale that at the rack level, it really leads to an exponential increase in, in power requirements. And what we're really seeing is these workloads are significantly exceeding the air cooling limits for ORV3 HPR rack-based architectures. Um, the last thing I would mention here is by incorporating liquid cooling technology into these architectures, you can increase the amount of current that you can carry by right around 5x uh, within the same footprint. So we just mentioned an exponential increase in power. Along with that, you need additional power equipment to supply it, so more power shelves, with more power supply units, battery backups. We're seeing the introduction of super cap shelves now. With all of this, it takes up space. Um, and what we really want is space in our IT gear racks to put more chips, more servers. So from an architecture perspective, what we're starting to see, and HPR v3 and HPR v4 are great examples of this, but it's the development of sidecar architectures where you have a dedicated power rack uh, that is next door to your IT gear rack. The idea here from a high level is we want to put as much power equipment as we can in a power rack, all of your power shells, battery backups, all of that stuff, um, and in power rack leaving more room for chips and servers in your IT gear rack. And then the last thing I would mention here is by incorporating liquid cooling technology into these rack track connections, you can reduce the amount of copper and reduce the number of connections needed to transfer power from one rack to the other. Uh, just to very quickly overview the liquid cooled bus bar versus air cooled equivalent, in ORV3 HPR. Um, you can see they're the same size and the same form factor, but the point I would really emphasize to the group today is you can carry right around 5x more current, again, within the same footprint, uh, same mounting. Um, I would also emphasize that the version that we're showing here is 750 kilowatts, so it can carry over 15,000 amps at 48 volts, um, but we are working to further optimize that, and there is a 1.2 megawatt version in work currently, and we are doing some initial exploration for sidecar connectivity for this. Uh, next, just a quick recap of the liquid cooled bus bar design and status updates since last year. Uh, Dimitri and I did present on this last year in a little bit more detail for the vertical liquid cooled bus bar, uh, including sharing some physical uh, testing data. Um, that presentation is linked here, so for those wanting more information, I would encourage you to, to uh, check out that link. Um, since that time, um, we've added features for HPRv3 horizontal bus bar mounting. So these bus bars can now mount, have mounting features at the front and the rear. Um, it can also incorporate the latest 72 kilowatt power shelves with the 12 kilowatt power supply units, and it can support both bolted and floating bus bar connectors such as the BB2000 or BB4000 series connectors. Um, in addition, the coolant interface has been updated to UQD04, and additional testing has been done, or reliability testing on the cold plates. Um, finally, what we are seeing is a proliferation or a spread in these types of designs. So multiple OCP vendors and hyperscalers are beginning to develop their own custom solutions using a liquid-cooled bus bar. And then Dimitri will talk about it a little bit more in a minute, but there is a 1.2 megawatt version in development. And now I'll hand it over to Dimitri. Thank you, Al. All right, so we're not going to go over the full details of liquid-cooled bus bar, just some of the changes that we've uh, incorporated over the last year. Um, so first thing, horizontal bus bar uh, mounting features. So we have 6OU at the bottom, 6OU at the top. Um, and I'll kind of go over detail later about how uh, the horizontal bus bar mates with those features. Um, in addition, uh, we are incorporating 72 kilowatt power shelves, which were mentioned before, which have bolted bus bar connections. So in order to bolt those connections to your liquid cool bus bar, you need some you know, covers and uh, safety features uh, to make sure that you can make that connection and keep it safe. Uh, so there's a modular 6OU bracket which can be removed uh, to make those bolted connections. There's a green clip that kind of covers that area. Um, 
and each one can be removed if you need to service those power shelves, uh, take them out. And then also the grounding blocks can be removed if you ever uh, want to put that 72 kilowatt power shelf in there, or they can be in place if you want to put an IT gear uh, connector in there. So it's really, the whole idea is it can be modular uh, based on the placement of your power shelves as well as your IT gear. Okay. Uh, in terms of the interface to you know, the rest of the whole cooling ecosystem at the data center, um, if you look at the right side, there's kind of two main options for connecting your liquid cool bus bar. Um, so on the left side of that picture, you'll see you can have your inlet at the bottom uh, and then outlet at the top. Uh, but for that, you need your inlet and outlet at both sides of the bus bar because you have coal plates on both the power and the return. Um, a much more, I guess, efficient way of doing it is if you have inlet at the bottom and then a loop at the top and then an outlet at the bottom again. Uh, so that way you don't need to twist any cables. Uh, you just have one cable coming out the side, another one coming out the bottom, and then a loop at the top. Um, and we've kind of standardized on a UKD04 connection. Um, so that way, it's very easy to service. Uh, you can have different host lengths. You don't need to have basically a rigid connection um, coming out of the bus bar. It's very easy to service. And um, you know, we have an ORW rack outside. Of course, for that, you need much longer hoses. If you want to put in an ORV3 rack, you have shorter hoses. So it's very easy to kind of have that fungibility. Uh, in terms of next generation liquid cool bus bars, so we talked about 750 kilowatts. Uh, of course, power limits are increasing. We're talking about megawatt racks. Uh, so one of the things that we developed recently is a 1.2 megawatt uh, liquid cool bus bar. Uh, so this has support for uh, larger bolted bus bar connections for 100 kilowatt shelves, or even if somebody wants to develop something larger, 150, 200 kilowatt shelves. Um, there's optionality there to bolt those bolted connections on there, just because it's pretty much impossible to carry those currents over connectors. Um, we also increased the uh, coal plate uh, much wider, and then upgraded the UKDs from UKD04 to UKD08, uh, just for higher uh, increased flow. And then it's also about 100 millimeters deeper. Uh, so even though we have a larger coal plate, you still need a lot more copper to manage the voltage drop and just overall current carrying capacity. Okay. Now we'll kind of go into the side power rack uh, and horizontal rack to rack architecture. Uh, so Mo, Jingjing, Jing, and Ben spoke a little bit about this earlier, but we'll go into deeper detail into the horizontal bus bar. Um, so of course, we're putting our power in a side power rack. All the power components are moving away. Um, and we're making connections to the side power rack using a horizontal bus bar. Uh, so this bus bar runs at 48 volts, and each horizontal bus bar is capable of about 500 amps of power, and uh, we'll go later, uh, you know, how we determine that. Um, and as I mentioned, there was an earlier presentation that kind of went over this as well. So this, all right. So this is how your horizontal bus bar looks like. And in more detail, when we look at the right side, um, it's a fairly simple construction. There's a positive bus bar, there's a return bus bar, uh, there's two connectors on each end, or one connector on each end, two connectors total, uh, and each connector can handle about 1,000 amps. Um, in addition, there's a flexible section in the middle that's basically a copper foil, um, and that is designed to account for tolerances between uh, rack placement as well as tolerances within the rack. Um, of course, you know, racks are not perfect. There's a couple mil millimeters of tolerance between the bus bar um, and rack interfaces. Uh, also, <coughs> Your power shelf is kind of what connects uh, your grounding of the whole rack to the tap box. Uh, if we don't have a power shelf in our IT rack, how do we get grounding to the, the IT rack? So that's why we have ground wires that are connected to the sheet metal that are then connected to the connectors um, on the outsides. And that kind of what, what carries your ground path over from your uh, power rack to your IT rack. Uh, there's also a sheet metal enclosure around the whole thing. Um, there's a flexible protection tube around the copper foil area. And then there's an ejector mechanism so that you can easily install and service the whole uh, horizontal bus bar. So this is an overview of how it gets installed. Um, and so we'll go into kind of some of the design considerations for this uh, whole system. Um, first is contact resistance. When you have a bunch of these horizontal bus bars in a, in a rack, uh, you want to minimize variation in contact resistance in, uh, within the horizontal bus bar as well as the interaction between the horizontal bus bar and the vertical bus bar. Um, and that's mostly to optimize current sharing between the horizontal bus bars. Um, reliability, you know, we don't want any deformation. We don't want plastic cracking. We don't want sheet metal getting bent. Um, so we go through a lot of shock and vibe testing and reliability testing to make sure this works well. 
Uh, serviceability, like I mentioned earlier, we have latches that um, allow for easy installation and removal of the whole thing. Uh, I mentioned earlier flexibility, we allow for plus or minus 10 millimeters of float, um, basically to account for rack manufacturing tolerances and then rack to rack alignment. Uh, safety, the whole thing is fully encapsulated in sheet metal, uh, there's insulation between conductors, uh, and then like I mentioned, the grounding path as well. Uh, and then for future applications, um, as you guys saw, there's a couple wider racks uh, out on the floor. Uh, so those can be connected with horizontal bus bars that are even wider. So you add 300 millimeters to the horizontal bus bar and you're good to go. Okay. Uh, in terms of temperature testing, uh, this is kind of a simple setup uh, that we did for our uh, temperature-rise testing. Uh, we put four, bus bar, four horizontal bus bars on the bottom, four at the top, uh, hooked up a DC source to it, put some thermocouples in the interface between the connectors and the, uh, the conductors within the horizontal bus bar. And then we ran the test. And based on this, of course, 30, 30 CT rise is kind of your limit for um, current carrying capacity. Uh, so at that point, we saw that it can handle about 500 amps uh, per horizontal bus bar or equivalent to about 25 kilowatts. Um, the, t the touch temperature on the sheet metal was a little bit higher, uh, significantly higher. Um, but since this is in the hot aisle, this, this thing would never get serviced when it's energized. So the risk is fairly low. And now I'll pass it over to Hal. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, next, we want to talk a little bit about pushing the boundaries for these horizontal bus bars for rack-to-rack -rack connections. So the standard HPR V3 horizontal bus bar that Dimitri's been talking about is really constrained by the copper size and just how much space we have behind the rack to work with. And in general, uh, you know, there's very large keep-out zones and data center halls in these area for, for multiple hyperscalers. So some things that we can do to help increase the current carrying capacity to potentially transfer more power if you look at the picture on the bottom, you can add dedicated fans for these horizontal bus bars. And if you look at the rendering on the top right, you could potentially add the same liquid cooling technology to these horizontal rack-to-rack -rack bus bar connections that we've been talking about with the vertical bus bar. And potentially when you do this, a couple of the goals is number one, you could transfer more power from your power rack to your IT rack by doing this. Or number two, you could reduce the number of connections uh, needed from your power rack to your IT rack. So for example, Dimitri showed something earlier with 12 connections. Um, from your power rack to I your IT gear rack, and this could potentially be reduced down to four or five. Next, just want to share a little bit of physical testing and thermal simulation data for these. Um, for the physical testing, this would be for the air-cooled version, and uh, on the bottom left there, you can see where we mounted the thermocouples with the gold circles, and really the team did their best to get these next to the hot spots. For the thermal simulation piece, you can see the simulation parameters on the top left that we used. Uh, as Dimitri touched on, um, with really with no help, these can carry right around 500 amps each from one rack to the other. And as you look at the table and you can kind of see it going from liquid cooled to direct fans. And when you combine adding direct fans with liquid cooling to this, you can go from 500 amps to well over 1100 amps. Um, so it's more than a 2.3 X increase in current carrying capacity. And I think there's the potential to even optimize this further as we move forward. Uh, finally, for a call to action, uh, we are developing an OCP design spec for the liquid cooled bus bar. We're planning to contribute that right around Q1 of next year. Um, in addition to that, we're working on further design improvements. Again, further development of the 1.2 megawatt version that Dimitri just talked about. In addition, the ORW base version. And we're doing some early exploration with this technology to incorporate it to the latest HBDC architectures. Uh, for those wanting more information, um, I'm including Lily Zhang's contact information. She's the product manager for bus bars at T Connectivity. Uh, for those of you that want to talk a little bit more about power architecture, there's my contact information below. And then finally, uh, some links to the OCP Rack and Power uh, project wiki and then specs and designs. Thank you very much. Power rocks. I'm curious, in all that shock and vibe testing you were doing, Nathan, did you find um, that the, the flexible section in the middle, did, did, were you able to characterize kind of the, the impact of that specific section to the overall reliability of the assembly? Uh, so as far as I know, during that testing, uh, there was no impact to that area. So okay. Yeah. All right, and the, the, I guess you, you thermocoupled around it too, and so yeah, you also didn't see any um, Significant deviations in, 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 no. in temperature through that no. structure. No. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you.